Okay, it's fine. Um, my first question would be is like, will Lisa ever fly? Or should I say NGO? <laughs> Can academia create epic bake sales for the Senate or military industrial complex? I mean, fundraisers, shameless plugs. Well, it probably depends on the Pathfinder mission, which is scheduled to launch this year or next year. Fairly shit soon. Yeah. So I think, you know, the problem with a big, big mission like that is people get a bit cautious and they're like, are you really, really, really sure that this is going to work? So it's, it's been hard to make the solid sell of that without having more, more data yeah. backing it up. But Yeah, they did a review, um, I don't know, a year or two ago. I don't remember the date. But they, there were some big missions they were thinking about funding in Europe, and Lisa was one of them, but the conclusion was just what Jocelyn is saying. They wanted to wait for this thing called Lisa Pathfinder, which is a, a preliminary mission that won't detect the gravitational waves, but will demonstrate some of the important technologies that, that, that it would need. They need to be able to, um, they need to, be able to uh, keep the spacecraft craft moving very precisely so that the, the the, what the mirrors are like not drifting too much isn't, isn't that yeah they, the well they, they need to yeah they need to have yeah. everything very carefully measured and locked and they can't yeah. you can't do any repairs when you're in space which is a right. big challenge so so just getting everything proving that they can do there were just too many things that they hadn't proven that can be done in space and so they decided to be a little more conservative I, I think also you know, we, we expect with advanced LIGO to be making ground-based gravitational wave detections within the next decade or so. Yeah. And that's going to provide more more of the foundation that will want, you know, people will want to or be more willing to invest in space-based missions when they've already seen that this can be done. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, I think that's true. A lot of people are sort of saying, well, we'll just sit back and see once they've actually detected gravitational waves and we're sure that they're real for sure then you know then are you feel better. are you liking this by the way our setting we're shooting at redwoods in orange county california i think it's great i mean anything that's unusual and it's nice to be out of the office for a day yeah getting to see some some nature so introduce yourselves okay why don't you go professor ahead. jocelyn go first um i'm jocelyn reed i'm an assistant professor in the department of physics at california state university fullerton um, and I've just joined the Gravitational Wave Physics and Astronomy Center there with uh, Jeffrey and um, another professor who couldn't be with us today, Josh Smith. So, yeah, I'm Jeffrey Lovelace. I'm, I'm another uh, new professor at Cal State Fullerton. Um, Jocelyn and, and Josh and I are working in the Gravitational Wave Center there. We have different areas that we focus on, but they're all working towards this goal of contributing to the effort to find these gravitational waves. Okay, so brings us to the next one, or our first question that, uh, that you answered. Um, can you describe to our viewers what the difference between LISA and LIGO is? Okay, um, well, so, so, <laughs> so LISA is um, a set of, okay, so let's, we should maybe back up and yeah. say what a gravitational what? wave is. Yeah, maybe we should say something about that. Go ahead. Good idea. So. Okay, so so say you have two stars, these are my stars, well actually something very compact, like two black holes or two neutron stars that are collapsed and dense. And they orbit each other, and as they orbit they set up uh, ripples in the space and time around them. And as they go around, they lose energy that ripples out. Like if you had two speedboats tied together going around and it would send out waves, those waves actually cause these uh, two, two objects to fall towards each other. And they spiral in and crash together and send out a big ripple of waves. And, and what, what this kind of wave is, is it's a change in the distances and times between objects or between uh, points. So we try and measure them, we, we measure a very precise measurement of distance in one direction and a very precise measurement of distance in the other direction and we see how they change relative to each other and that says that a gravitational wave has gone. So it's like my arms are like this. <laughs> so it, yeah, it's, it's more like they're like this <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. once they, you kind of get squished. So like it gets squashed in one direction and stretched in the other direction, but not by very much. Um, LIGO is the the detector built on the ground and there are two mirrors that'll get stretched and squeezed back and forth and the mirrors are eight kilometers apart each each side of the mirror of the arm is four kilometers long so there's like an arm that's four kilometers and another arm that's four kilometers and across that distance 
then the mirrors move by less than the size of a proton. So it's like Lisa, it's a triangle? Yeah, so Lisa is a triangle, so, so you have all the three space, spacecraft um, yeah. bouncing the signals off of each other, and they measure how the triangle would deform. How far away are those, those arms? It's a lot bigger than the Earth, isn't it not? Yeah. Right, right. So Lisa would be, um, if you have an idea of the scale of the Earth, Lisa is like a third of the way behind Earth's orbit. And right, but how, how big are the arms? Arms the distance, triangle? yeah. How long is one of the arms in Lisa? I don't remember that number. It's like a, a few Earths. A few Earths? But I, I don't remember actually. That's okay. That's okay. Um, tell our viewers in non-academic way, non-academia way, what would be the benefits of these two satellites for the Vox Populi? What would be the benefits? Yes. Well, okay, so this is... So on, there are a lot of ways you could answer that. One thing you could say is all of the science that we do, at least in terms of astronomy, a lot of it is just very basic science and basic research doesn't always have an immediate payoff. The theory of relativity that describes the things we're trying to see, gravitational waves, black holes, neutron stars, this theory was created, well, it was, uh, was first put down in 1915. That's when Einstein first got the equation together. Um, but um, um, applications that rely on general relativity, like you know, the GPS in your phones that t told us how to get here, those applications didn't come along for about a century afterwards. Yeah, it's like the CDMA technology was, the patent was like in the 40s. Yeah. yeah. Or, right. or if, if, you know, you can even go further back and when people were first trying to understand the, uh, the electron levels in an atom and how electrons worked, that was, you know, so, so, uh, I, there was some quote, it's like, you know, well, what use is it to know how the electrons behave in an atom? How could that possibly be useful? And at the time, the scientists said, well, what use is the, the colors on a butterfly's wing? It's just something we look at because it's beautiful. But every piece of electronics that you use and every material that you that's been developed requires understanding this electronic structure. Yeah. So we're laying, we're trying to understand the universe and that seems to have paid off pretty well in the past. That's a good way to say it. You can't always predict what the benefit will be and there can be a long time between when the basic research is done and when you get the applications. But you can't go there, into... There's also spin-offs along the way That's too. True. Like trying to figure out how to do these kinds of measurements that we've never been able to do before, you end up developing a lot of technology and pushing the limits of what we can create. What? So it's a good driver for, for technology. Yeah, I don't know too much about the details, but I know that uh, one thing that they're getting a lot better at in trying to detect gravitational waves is some aspects of optics, like making better materials that make better mirrors, and that can, that can come up in other more practical settings than what we're doing. Yes. Um, well, for the next next gen of these satellites, the BBO, or I should say Big O, like can big you? Bang observer? Yes, the Big Bang yeah, Observatory. <laughs> so go ahead. So this is, I don't know. I think I think it's really cool. I'm not sure when they're actually going to build it, since Lisa already seems yeah. far off. But I think it's really cool. The cool thing about it is, well, these different detectors are all trying to see gravitational waves that are different from different kinds of sources. Um, LIGO is going to see gravitational waves, like Jocelyn said, from neutron stars and black holes that are spiraling together. Things that are comparable to the mass of the sun. Right. So, so yes, sort of. Ten solar mass, ten solar mass maybe a hundred at like the that. most. One thing that Lisa will see is it will see um, things like two supermassive black holes that might be a billion times the mass of the sun. Like the ones that you find together. in the center of our galaxy, galaxy yeah. Yeah. or other galaxies. It, it, it might see those. Or really far off LQGs, right? I mean, uh, large quasar groups. Well, those, those are black holes yeah. Yeah. In, our, in our best understanding. So, you know, anytime you have black holes, massive black holes on a galactic scale merging together, that's the kind of thing Lisa would try and be able to see. Yeah, and so the Big Bang Observatory, why I think it's really cool is it's trying to see gravitational waves from the very early universe. In the, in the early universe, um, uh, before a few hundred thousand years or so after the Big Bang, everything was very opaque, and it was opaque to light. The matter was uh, dense enough and ionized so that you, you, we can't see directly with light farther so, back than So that. when we look out into space, we look back in time. Yes. Because light propagates at a finite speed rate. So, so if we look far enough back with, with, with optical techniques, with visual electromagnetic spectrum, you see the cosmic microwave background radiation 
as the the limit that's the you see back to where that was released or when that was released and then you can't see anything behind that it's opaque so gravitational waves would allow you to see through the opa right. the, the opacity to electromagnetic radiation oh so it might even kind of show us like the umbilical cord <laughs> it might show us something about the very early universe farther back that we can directly see with light and th this is cool because this is when the universe was very small and the energy scales were very high. And so it's a similar idea to what some of these high energy experiments are looking at, except in principle you can see much higher energies than we'll ever make in a lab. Okay. So. Oh, um, this one is directed to Professor Jocelyn. Uh, please tell us about your titanium physicist blog. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, a, f a friend of mine from undergraduate, uh, ben Benjamin Tippett, um, is, uh, has started in the last couple years this blog, which he calls the Titanium Physicists. And so every week or so, he, uh, he'll invite two physicists to, along with himself to explain a topic to a guest who's often a webcomic artist or an artist or a writer or another podcaster or just someone who's not really a physicist. And so, so I've been on, I don't know, on 10 or so of these. And it's a, it's a lot of fun because we have three physicists all talking at once, trying to explain something. But the guest will say, wait a sec, that made no sense, and make us back up and actually explain things again. And uh, we talk about entropy, black holes, um, we've talked about gravitational waves and neutron stars and cloaking devices. Um, a lot of, and we, we've done a little bit also, ben, ben and I are both gravitational physicists, so that's sort of the core of a lot of the material we talk about. But, um, but we've had astronomy and condensed matter and, and all sorts of just, you know, cool topics that, that, that we spend, well, we spend about an hour talking about and then edit it down to a cool, punchy half hour for the podcast. Awesome. This one is directed to you, Professor Lovelace. What are the geometrical dimensions of a recently merged binary star system? The geometrical dimensions? Because okay. like when they collide, like those two stars, like they look like blobs. I mean, can you describe? Can I describe what they look like? Mm. Okay, that's actually, let's see. So, um, so when two, two black, black holes have a size, and the black hole sizes depend on how big they are. So we've been talking mostly about black holes that are, um, that are maybe sort of the mass of the sun, maybe 10 times as massive as the sun. The kinds of black holes you'll find in galaxies, but not the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. So there's a, there's a mathematical relation between how big the black hole is and how, um, and, and how massive it is. And so for these kinds of black holes, they're going to be something like, you know, uh, tens of kilometers in circumference if you measured the distance around their surface. The surface is the horizon, the surface where if you fall in, you're not coming back out. And so this is something like, um, like if you centered um, a 10 solar mass black hole at Cal State Fullerton, then it would, uh, it would, uh, just, it would just barely reach towards like uh, Los Angeles, if I remember the map right. It'll cover a good part of Southern California, but that's it. So imagine compressing 10 times the mass of the sun to a space about the size of the greater Los Angeles area or so. Or if you have, uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, the Earth, if the Earth were compressed small enough to be a black hole, it would be smaller than a golf ball. So imagine compressing the entire planet down to something about this size. And so those are kinds of the sizes that we're talking about. These black holes are very small for how massive they are. So that's what happens when like two stars collide? Did they necessarily fall into a singularity? Not necessarily. If two neutron stars collide and the total mass is big enough, then yeah. eventually they will. And Jocelyn so, knows so more about that. So, whenever you have something in space, you have this, um, you you have a competition between, for example, I am not following towards the center of the Earth right now because I'm stopped by pushing against the ground. So there's there's matter beneath my feet holding me up in a way. Um, so that's, that's what happens in regular stars. It's actually, there's also thermal and radiation pressure holding the outer layers up. Um, but, but eventually, uh, if the star runs out of fuel and collapses, it, will, it, it loses that ability to push out. And if the star is big enough, it, all the matter in the core will fall in. And eventually, um, if it falls in, I guess, uh, 
if, if you have enough matter falling in fast enough, it'll collapse to a black hole. If it's um, not quite enough matter, it, it can end up as a neutron star, which is actually this, these two are um, a maximum mass neutron star. So if this was five miles per inch, this is a slice through a neutron star that's twice the mass of our sun. Wow. Um, so that's five miles per inch. So, so I don't know, I don't know, about 15 miles across there. And then this is a black hole of the same scale. So this is actually just on the point of collapse. So the matter here has been compressed so much that if I added just a tablespoonful more, then it would be, uh, it would be so compressed that it would just collapse down into the singularity of the black hole. So they're, they're the same outside the, uh, outside the surface of the star. They, they, you can't tell the difference between the star and the black hole from the way gravitational potentials are. But um, you, you, get, you get close enough and you collapse in. So if you have two of these stars uh, going around each other, they would collapse to a black hole that would be about uh, twice the distance around the horizon. If you had lower mass stars, you could have them collapse to something like this. Okay.